Next on our agenda is our reversing valve, our four-way reversing valve. And it seems to be a little complicated. People get overwhelmed by it. We're going to break down all of the individual components to where it becomes simple and easy for you to understand. And of all these pipes that we have, we simply need to know first off where two are. The two that's always going to be the same. So I've installed this one just like we drew it last time to where the one pipe by itself is at the bottom. But remember, this pipe can be installed in multiple different configurations, but the one pipe by itself, no matter how it's installed, is always going to be the high pressure, high temperature, superheated vapor, the discharge line, also known as the hot gas line. That's always going to be the same. Of the three pipes, no matter which direction it's possibly mounted, the one in the middle of the three is always going to be low temperature, low pressure, superheated vapor, the suction gas line. So this one is always going back to the compressor. This one's always coming out of the compressor. So that's half of our battle. We had four pipes. Now we've eliminated two of them. We only have two pipes left. So now we can just simply think of where do we want to send that hot gas? In the summertime, I want to send that hot gas outside. So what we do is we send the hot gas through this pipe and it goes to the outdoor coil. We desuperate it, change it from vapor to a liquid, subcool that liquid, send the liquid to the indoor medium device, bullet from a liquid to vapor, superheat that vapor, and that low temperature, low pressure, superheated vapor comes from the inside back over here to our reversing valve. It makes just this nice little loop here, continues all the way back to our compressor and our cycle starts again. Now, in the winter time, you can think, man, where do I want to send that hot gas? In the winter time, do you want to send the hot gas outside the house or do you want to send that hot gas inside the house? So in the winter time, we simply just move this valve over. We send our high temperature, high pressure, superheated vapor to the indoor coil. So now it's still vapor. We send that vapor to the suction gas line, the vapor line. It goes to the indoor coil to where we end up changing it from a vapor to a liquid. We subcool that liquid to the metering device outside. Bullet from a liquid vapor, superheat the vapor, then that low temperature, low pressure, superheat the vapor coming from the outdoor coil continues right here on the one pipe by itself. It just makes this nice little loop right here. And from that nice little loop, we continue on our suction line all the way back to the compressor. So we have all these pipes and all this stuff to think about, but really, if we know that this one's always suction, low pressure, superheated vapor, and we know that this one's always high temperature, high pressure, superheated vapor, that's half of our battle. These two pipes are gonna be the one that change, and it's gonna be depending on how it's piped and where those pipes are going. But if we are to understand where these go, we're halfway there. Now let's take a look at how that actually moves. This is gonna be high temperature, high pressure, superheated vapor, discharge gas. This is always gonna be low temperature, low pressure, superheated vapor, suction gas. So blue gauge and your red gauge. This one's gonna change positions depending on what mode it's in, and this one's gonna change position. But they're always gonna be superheated vapor on all of these pipes, always vapor. If we cut this open, we can have a better look at what's happening. So in this mode, this is always high temperature, high pressure, superheated vapor, hot gas. Superheated vapor comes through and it's going to hit the top of this and it can't go anywhere. It's going to fill up most of the cylinder, but it goes over here and there's a little path for it to go through. There's this little hole right here. So the high temperature, high pressure superheated vapor is going to go this way. It's going to go through this hole and it's going to go over here to this pipe going to one of the coils. On the other hand, the suction gas is going to be coming back through this pipe it's going to make this little U-bend right here. It's just going to make this nice little U-turn and continue back on the suction gas. So in this mode, the high pressure line, high temperature, high pressure, superheated vapor, discharge gas, hot gas line is coming this way through this little hole right here, continuing on to whatever coil this is. Suction gas is coming back through this side. It makes a nice little U-turn and continues on to our compressor. When the reversing valve moves, it just simply slides over just like that. Now we're sending a high temperature, high pressure superheated vapor into this. It can't go anywhere other than over here. There's a little hole for it to go through. So it goes right through this hole, continues on, and now it's going to this opposite coil. Coming back, we have low temperature, low pressure superheated vapor, comes through this, makes this nice little U-turn right here, and continues on back to the compressor. So no matter what happens, if this thing moves from one position to the next, it's still only vapor. High pressure vapor, low pressure vapor, but it's still only going to be vapor. There's no liquid anywhere on this valve. It's important for us to remember. So this valve, when it changes position, when it reverses from heating and cooling, this just simply slides over. That's all it takes, that little bit of a slide movement. It is very, very simple. Now let's look at how that's actually working. I'm just going to remove this slide piece. And now we can see this is the heart of really what's making most of that reversing valve happen. 
right here. And we see this is just a type of Teflon, a type of plastic right here. It's all that is. And this plastic slides right here on this piece of brass, this flat black brass plate that's right here. And this piece of metal either connects these two pipes or move over and connect these two pipes. So if I'm connecting these two pipes right here, that means that this pipe is available for hot gas. And when it slides the other direction, all it does is simply cup or connect these two pipes, and now our hot gas simply goes in this direction. And it's that high temperature, high pressure that's pushing down on this piece that helps make that seal. So we see that's just that little Teflon ring, but that high pressure pushing against this low pressure makes that seal. So we don't have any leakage going on. And it just simply changes position from here over here to this side. Now to make this move, that's where we're gonna need the rest of this little mechanism right here. So it's really cool because this just fits right inside of here, this little track in there, and this slides down inside of the main valve body. Now here's the magic of what's happening. We're gonna be using high pressure on this side and low pressure on this side. Notice we have a little Teflon ring here. So if I put high pressure on this side and I put low pressure on this side, we're gonna slide that valve in this direction. Now these two are suction and these two are high temperature, high pressure, super vapor, hot gas line, has no other chance to go. But if I reverse it and then I put high pressure on this side and I connect this side to low pressure, this valve is simply gonna just slide right on over. It's just gonna move over. And that's how we make the valve move, just simply using pressure differential. It is very simple for this to move. Notice this little piece of brass here. We got these little pieces of seal. We got these little ends, and these ends actually end up plugging a little bitty hole right here in the side. If we move this out of the way, we can see that we have a little hole right here, and we have a little bitty hole right here. So let's talk about what those holes are connected to. And if we turn this over, we see that there is piping connected to those and it goes to another valve. So to cause that pressure differential, we're gonna use a little miniature valve. This is gonna be a pilot valve, a miniature reversing valve. And if we know that this pipe is always, always, always high pressure, that high pressure line goes over here to this little bitty miniature valve, the pilot valve, the miniature reversing valve. And what this valve does, it says, hey, I want it to change position. So we take that high pressure vapor over here to our miniature reversing valve, this is gonna connect it to the pipe right here in the side. In other words, this pipe goes right over here to the end. So this is now high pressure. But it also connects this side, this space over here, this side through this pipe is gonna go through a pilot valve and it's gonna connect that over here to the low pressure side. So by connecting this side right here to low pressure, and this side right here to high pressure, we have a pressure differential. So this valve is just gonna move over in this direction. We make the whole entire valve move simply by a pressure difference. We wanna move the other direction, we change our pilot valve, and now we have our high temperature, high pressure coming through our pilot valve, and we connect it through this little bitty tube on this side. So we got high pressure over here in this side, and then on this, my always suction, true suction, we connect it over here to the opposite side. So now if I have low pressure over here and I have high pressure over here, the valve is simply gonna move the other direction. And we're using this pilot valve, using the pressure to make the main valve move. And it just simply uses that pressure differential and makes the valve move from one position over to the other. Now to make this valve change, what we use is a solenoid valve. This is simply an electromagnet. Most of them are 24 volts, but some of them are 120 or even 240 volts. But right here we have two little prongs. We energize an electromagnet and it makes this valve move. And when we de-energize this, it de-energizes the electromagnet and a spring pushes it back to a normal position. Now, most of the time, these will be piped where they're naturally in heating mode, and then we activate them to go to another mode. Most manufacturers use what we call a cooling activated reversing valve. In other words, they activate this electromagnet with voltage and make it go into cooling mode. If I deactivate it, it naturally goes back to its heating mode. Most, but not all manufacturers do that. That means if I de-energize this electromagnet, we're using the high pressure and it's connecting the high pressure over here to this side. So the high pressure is connected to this side and then on the suction side, we connect that over here to the opposite end. So if there's low pressure here and there's high pressure here, the valve is naturally going to just slide the other direction. So the high pressure is pushing this way, low pressure over here is connecting back, the valve's naturally in this mode. And then we energize this with usually 24 volts, but not always. I energize this electromagnet, it makes this pallet valve change position. 
So now I'm sending that hot gas over here to this side. So the hot gas is connecting over here to this side, high pressure, and then it connects this side to low pressure. So this side to low pressure. So we have low pressure here and high pressure here. We've activated or energized our electromagnet. Now we simply are using that pressure differential to move the reversing valve this direction. So it simply uses pressure differential. I energize this with voltage, electromagnet activates. We're in this mode. I de-energize this, the pressure differential changes, and I use that pressure differential to move it the opposite direction. Extremely simple. This slides so very, very smooth. It just slides back and forth. Very easy. Nothing to it. There's really nothing inside of here to get hung up or cause damage. The main issue is gonna be these little bitty pilot tubes and this little bitty pilot valve. These holes here are very small and these pipes are very small. So earlier we've talked many times about brazing with a flow of nitrogen to prevent oxidation. We talked about making sure we keep the pipes clean. If we end up with oxidation or contamination, that contamination can clog up these little bitty tubes and it can clog up this reversing valve, this pilot valve inside of here. So if this gets clogged up or one of these tubes get clogged up, we can't have the pressure differential we need to make this valve slide. Now, if you imagine if we're gonna use this as a direct action, we would need this solenoid to be massively big with a giant spring to be able to make this move directly. So it's a whole lot more cost effective using the smaller pilot valve and using our pressure differential we already have to make this valve move. But it's also important that we follow the installation procedures and best practices so that we flow nitrogen, we keep the lines clean while we're brazing so that we don't end up with this happening. Even though we're not working directly in this section, we're working anywhere in the system. Maybe I'm brazing on the evaporator coil and then with that oxidation and with PE oil, it's gonna strip that from the sides and it's gonna end up getting clogged up in these tubes potentially. It doesn't happen very often, but if you're having an issue with these reversing valves failing often, there's a high chance that they weren't brazing with the flow of nitrogen. So keeping the system clean is essential for its operation. You can see as long as we have clean refrigerant, there's really nothing really in its way to change this from going from one side to the other. So you can see we have our suction pressure and our high head pressure, and it's just right there, the difference between the always high pressure and always low pressure. So let's see what happens once we disconnect this reversing valve. So we're just gonna pull this wire right here. You see the high pressure drops, the suction pressure rises, but it doesn't take very long and we end up with the high pressure going back up again and the suction pressure starts to drop. But it's only vapor, it's vapor, 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 vapor. So it takes a little bit to catch back up. The compressor kind of just free spins for a little bit. You can hear it get louder, but it's only vapor. So if I re-energize this again, it won't matter because it's still only vapor. Of all four of these ports, it's all vapor. So we can see our suction pressure is gonna start dropping again. The head pressure is still gonna start rising up again. And we're gonna be back in cooling mode here in just a little bit. Now some catches are the fact that we have this little Teflon ring here and we have this little Teflon seal here. So they are very susceptible to heat. You, get, you don't wanna get this above 212 degrees. You wanna keep this nice and cool. So when we're replacing these, we wanna make sure we wrap these and protect this because if we overheat that little Teflon seal here, we're not gonna have a seal and we could be leaking refrigerant from one side to the other. And if we don't have that Teflon seal making it here, we won't be able to create the seal we need to cause the pressure differential for this to move properly. So making sure we protect this. Now, most of the time, these are misdiagnosed. People say that they're bad when they're not. And most of the time, I found out that it's really just this solenoid. We have a bad solenoid, and they say that the entire reversing valve is bad. I've been to over 20 or 30 different service calls to where they said we had a bad reversing valve and nothing was wrong with it. I've only had to replace probably about five reversing valves in my entire career. So they don't fail very often. And a lot of times, even if you get a little bit of debris stuck in one of these tubes, you can just simply reverse it back and forth, use that pressure differential. And sometimes it's enough to loosen that little bit of a clog that's in here to allow everything to start working again. You wanna make sure though that you're protecting this, not only from heat, but also from damage. I worked with a man that said, oh, he liked to tap these with a hammer to get them loosened up. Well, this is brass, very soft brass. If you hit that brass with anything, you will bend the brass and now you end up with this, this nice cylinder not being able to move properly inside of here because of the damage. And I have had to replace one before because it had hammer marks on it and because those hammer marks, it wouldn't allow this slide to move back and forth. So make sure that we take care of this. We protect this is going to be important.
Another thing that's overlooked often is they need a pressure differential to work. I could energize this and we could hear this nice little clink noise happening here in our pilot valve, but it doesn't mean our main valve is moving. So making sure that the compressor is running, that I have a pressure differential between the high and low side so that I can make this valve move is very important. I had somebody that, that condemned one of these and they didn't even have the compressor running. They said, well, the valve wasn't moving back and forth. I said, well, was the system running? I said, no, it was in a vacuum. So there's no way that we can make this move without the compressor running and refrigerant in it because we need the pressure differential and we need really approximately 100 PSI pressure difference. Every brand's a little different, but we do need a pressure differential between the high side and low side so that we can make this valve move. But look how simple this process is. It's nice and simple, great engineering. And if you have a strong enough magnet, you can see where the slide is inside because all this is brass. The magnet won't stick, but it will stick to the metal. And it's not sticking here at all, but I get over here and it's sticking. And then on this side, we can see that it's sticking all the way at the end. So I know that that slide is all the way in this direction. In other words, that slide is in the position just like this. Because if I put my magnet right here on this side, we can see that it holds onto it just like it did at the top. And over here, it's not sticking on this side but it does stick right here at this section because it's magnetized to that part right there. Just this little piece that carries it. We got the little seal here. Notice these, these little end pieces right here, how they're coned and how that fits right inside of these little holes right here. And another thing I think that's neat about these, we do have that Teflon ring right here. It's just that little cup that, that connects these two. This is actually a double walled metal. So this piece of metal has a gap between it on this side. Some of them are just simply an air gap and some of them I found have Teflon in it, but these are two individual separate pieces of metal. So it's not just one piece of metal separating the low temperature gas from the high temperature gas. There's a double walled metal that adds a little bit of an insulation value. But I think that's pretty cool that that high pressure pushes on this to make that seal. And this just simply slides this way, connects these two pipes. The hot gas is diverted the other way, or it slides over this way, connects these two pipes and diverts the hot gas the other way. Extremely simple. We use a pressure differential so that we can make this pipe move back and forth. We use a little pilot valve to change the pressures of which direction we're sending it. And then we use an electromagnet to make this electrically energized product. Now, some of these electromagnets are 24 volts, but there are some brands that have 120 and 240 volt electromagnetic coils. You always want to check with the manufacturer what you're working with. Over time, you'll get used to understanding and realizing that most of them are 24 volts. Ream and Rude for residential, they are 240 volts typically, but always check because manufacturers can change stuff. Now, Ream and Root are also opposite of all the other brands. They use a heating activated reversing valve. That means that naturally it's in the cooling mode. But what they do is when you energize this electromagnet, it makes this shift and forces it in the heating mode where we're sending the hot gas inside the house. Now, most reversing valves are cooling activated. It means when we activate this electromagnet, it makes it go in the cooling mode. We de-energize it, it goes back to its natural mode of heating. Ream and Rude, and there's some other examples, are naturally in cooling mode and they activate the electromagnet to force it to go into heating mode. So every manufacturer is different. There's no set way it has to be. So it really just comes down to where do you want that hot gas to go? You know, this is always hot gas, high temperature, high pressure, circuit vapor. And do you want that hot gas to go inside the house? or do you want to move that hot gas to where it goes outside the house? If I'm sending hot gas outside the house, that means this has to be the suction line from the indoor unit. And it just makes a little loop right here with this little cup. And we have a true suction always back to the compressor. And if I want to send the hot gas inside the house, we reverse it this direction. We send that hot gas this direction inside the house. And then we bring the suction gas from outside. It just loops through that little cup we have to have at least a 100 PSI pressure differential to have the pressure so that we can make this valve move. We have the solenoid valve that energizes the pilot valve. 
that uses pressure differential to make this move. This is made of soft brass, so never strike it. We must protect it from heat when we're doing any kind of abrasing in here so that we don't damage the Teflon seals. And most of the time, it's gonna be this solenoid that goes bad. There's some other testing we can do later that we're gonna talk about, but this gives you the idea of what's happening, the most important sections of our reversing valve. Now, also I said you can mount this just about any way you wanted. You can't mount it this direction. You can't mount it like this. And the reason is oil and the oil from the system will build up in here. It will fill up these little tubes and it won't allow it to shift right. So we can't install it like this or like this because of the oil issue. Now you can install them like this. You'll see them many different ways. You'll see them installed like this or anywhere like this or like this. However that manufacturer designed it's going to be fine. However it came from that manufacturer, put it back like the manufacturer suggests, like they had it from the factory. And if somebody did change it up, go inspect from the factory and find out how it's supposed to be so you can put it back like it's supposed to be and it's gonna operate great. And later on, we're gonna talk about reversing valves and some of the torch tips we can use. We can heat up all of these at the same time and replace them. We'll do an example of that later on. I wanna give a special thanks to student of HVAC. JD has been doing a really lot of work about helping me make some of these pictures, some of these images to help bring this concept across to you remotely. He has an Instagram page and he has tons of stuff. We're working on an electrical series. He's been making some really, really awesome pictures and stuff that help make things simple and simplify some of these concepts. So go give him a follow and give a shout out to JD, a student of HVAC, and uh, give him that appreciation for his help on some of these projects.